to the last session of the day, the second keynote address. Before I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Steve High, I want to um, say that the immediately following the keynote lecture, we have uh, our banquet. Uh, those of you who are joining us at the banquet uh, will just follow us. It's a two-minute walk going out the gallery. You make a left, you go through the parking lot, and then immediately on the other side of the parking lot, you will see the McDonald's Stewart Building, and you will see the sign PJ. That's the uh, name of the um, room where our banquet will be held. There'll be wine and food, and uh, a bit of time to relax before the food is being served. So. Uh, and we do have uh, about uh, four uh, seats left at the banquet, so any of you who uh, have not uh, made arrangements for it, you can still join us uh, tonight. So um, it's been a wonderfully rich day. I've learned a lot today, and, um, and I'm, I look forward to the talk coming up. So it's with great pleasure that I want to introduce Dr. Steve High from uh, Concordia University, he's a Canada research chair there, um, who has a wonderfully rich history, innovative history of publications, a very distinguished history of scholarship. Uh, his first monograph, Industrial Sunset, The Making of North America's Rust Belt, which came out in 2003, uh, was based on oral narratives, and it won a number, a large number of prestigious prizes from the American Historical Association for Best Book in Canada, United States uh, Relations, as well as from the Canadian Sociology and Anthropology Association for Best Book on Canadian Society. And also from the Federation of the Humanities and Social Sciences in Canada for the, book, uh, the best book published in the humanities that year. His second book was equally distinguished. It's called Corporate Wasteland, the Landscape and Memory of Deindustrialization, which was co-published by Cornell University Press and Between the Lines Press. Uh, it was published in October 2007, and his third book that came out in 2008 uh, was called Base Colonies in the Western Hemisphere, published by Palgrave and Macmillan. Uh, this was based, uh, he's, he's the primary investigator of a 1.2 million collaborative research project entitled Life Stories of Montrealers Displaced by War, Genocide, and Other Human Rights Violations. This is a community university research alliance project that runs from 2007 to 2012, and it's funded by SHRC. Um, and it brings together 40 university-based researchers and community participants, as well as 18 community partners who are examining the life stories of Montreal residents who fled large-scale violence in Rwanda, Haiti, Cambodia, and Nazi Europe. In addition to this project, to life stories, Dr. Ha is also working on two other book projects. The first, More Than a Paycheck, Place Memory and Belonging in a Former Mill Town investigates the meaning of job loss in a foresty town that has lost its economic reason for being. Uh, the project includes a memory scape component. The second project he's involved in at present is looking at the wartime memories of residents in St. John's, Newfoundland. And the talk, the title of the talk today is From Collection to Curation, Oral History in a Time of Multimedia Authorship and Collaborative Practice. Please give Steve a warm welcome. I'd like to uh, thank uh, both Susan and Smero for, for inviting me to be here. It's been a great day, and uh, I really enjoyed yesterday's keynote as well. Um, my first encounter with oral history, like many people's first encounter with oral history, uh, was an accident. Uh, it was 24 years ago, I was an undergraduate student, and I returned to my hometown of Thunder Bay on the north shore of Lake Superior, and I found a summer job for minimum wage. And so they gave me a, a pile of analog audio cassettes and a very old uh, tape recorder, and they basically instructed me, you know, go interview old people. And that was basically it. I spent the whole summer interviewing old people, and I fell in love with both the source and, and the methodology, that, that this was a, a, a way into the past that spoke to me. 
you know, the history is personal, that it has a face and a name. These large structures that, that shape our lives are very, very important, but how that is then felt at that sort of individual level is also very, very important. Now, oral history um, uh, as, a, as a field um, has a very, you know, uh, recent, um, recent history. Uh, it emerged outside the academy for the most part, uh, until very recently, it was sort of seen as a, a Mickey Mouse, an amateur approach to, to history. People often would speak about, you know, what about memory? Why, you know, people are not going to tell you the truth. They're going to misremember. How representative is it that what you're hearing and so on? Um, and the, the field really emerged, I think, in, 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 in sort of uh, more local history type spaces. Uh, and it certainly was accompanied by the diffusion of, uh, of the tape recorder. And some of the earlier projects um, that I can think of, uh, I'm just thinking of Sean's talk about um, uh, the Royal Tour of Canada. One of the earliest oral history projects was in the United States um, in the 1930s as part of a make-work project by the Franklin Delano Roosevelt uh, where uh, uh, dozens of people were hired to be uh, uh, to interview former slaves, right, who experienced slavery before 1865 and who were still living in 1936-37. And when you listen to those tapes, um, uh, you're transported, right? And when you hear the the spoken word, you know the spoken word is wrapped in emotion, and it's very very difficult to capture a lot of that uh, of that feeling. I think when we transcribe or go to text. So my talk this evening is, is very much focused on the Montreal Life Stories project. And actually the first two pages of my talk have been covered very effectively in, <laughs> in the introduction. Uh, what you see here are, are photographs by uh, David Ward, who is a co-applicant in our, in our project. Uh, he has taken um, thousands of photographs uh, of our process over the last seven years and I'm, I'm amazed at how still photography can capture process and collaboration in really innovative and, and interesting ways. Uh, as you heard, the Montreal Life Stories project received uh, funding in 2006 uh, from SHRC, uh, from a now defunct program called the Community University Research Alliance Program. And this program is a very special program in my mind. Uh, much of academic research is based on the idea of, of scholars going out there into, into that world beyond uh, and uh, researching and analyzing and gazing and coming back and reporting back to our, to our respective disciplines. Uh, the CURA program is predicated on the idea that communities can when possible and should, when possible, be partners in research and not simply objects of study. That when we, we expand the conversation, the circle who are involved in the research process early on, that the research process itself is enriched by that, by that fact. And so uh, the project uh, was envisioned collaboratively. Uh, we began as a small project of 40 people uh, and 18 community partners. These partners were uh, embedded very much in, um, in uh, the cultural communities. These are not mainly institutional partners. These are people with day jobs and, and, and so on. Um, the, um, the focus perhaps has been on the Rwandan, Cambodian, Haitian, and Montreal Jewish communities. But we also did have uh, several institutional partners that were, I think, very vital to, to our approach. Uh, these include the National Film Board, uh, the school boards, uh, Tees Redunia Theatre, which is a South Asian theatre company, um, uh, as well as Ekitas, which is a global human rights educational organization, and so on. And so right from day one, we, we felt that, um, that we were going to go beyond collection, right? That collection was not enough. The, um, you know, there's new forms of media, you know, that are quickly changing the ways that we think about and do oral and public history. Oral historians are now using a variety of digital technologies to record, organize, catalog, interpret, share, and exhibit the stories that we collect. 
We are in a transformative moment, especially when it comes to thinking about what happens after the interview. And as someone who has been interviewing people since 1988, I can actually say there's actually been a very, very much a continuity within the interview space itself. You know, at the beginning I was using audio, I went to VHS, these massive VHS cameras in the early 90s. Uh, now we have smaller uh, uh, HD cameras and so on. But that, I don't think, has transformed the interview space itself. What's really changed is what happens uh, thereafter. The, um, the, um, um, so the point is an important one. Oral historians have been so focused on the making of the interview that we've spent remarkably little time thinking about what to do with the audio or video recording. So if you go into oral history um, uh, journals and look at what oral historians are talking about, they're very much talking even today about the interview, right? And, and how do you do it right and the ethics and there's a lot of anxiety and anxious uh, uh, discussion about that. Uh, Michael Frisch, who's a very interesting oral historian, he has written that um, the deep dark secret of oral history is that nobody spends much time listening to or watching the recorded and collected interviews. We tend to go immediately to text. And if you think about um, the proliferation of transcription, for example, and what's lost in transcription, right? Again, if you think of the orality, the rhythm, um, the language, you know, you know it's, it's wrapped in meaning. And when you transcribe, you're just capturing just a small, small um, uh, part of what's going on in the interview, not to even mention the issue of body language and so on. The rise of intangible cultural heritage enshrined in the 2003 UNESCO Convention is opening up new and exciting perspectives on history and heritage. Audio or video record oral histories are, of course, central to the broadly defined notion of intangible culture. The timing is not coincidental. New digital technologies have made the intangible much more tangible in recent years. The result, according to Laval folklorist Laurier Turgeon, is a new era of heritage. Canadians are increasingly seeking a heritage that is interactive, participatory, and living. That said, the challenges facing us are many. There are tens of thousands of oral history interviews already sitting in archival drawers and computer hard drives that have never been listened to. Thousands of new interviews are being added to this number each year by the many large testimony projects now underway. And I'm thinking, for example, Canada's Truth and Reconciliation Commission that is uh, collecting thousands of statements with Aboriginal um, survivors of, uh, of residential schools. How can we combine oral history and digital media to ensure that the potential of these important projects and others like them is fully realized? Moreover, how are digital media and the arts transforming our research practice as social science and humanity scholars? The impulse to collect rather than to listen, I believe, is holding us back. It is sometimes said that we live in an age of testimony. Eyewitness accounts from survivors of war and genocide fill the airwaves and the web. Large testimony projects such as Steven Spielberg's Survivor of the Shoah Visual History Foundation have recorded tens of thousands of individual testimonies. Thousands more have been told, have told their horrific stories to truth and reconciliation commissions and courtrooms around the world. These often visceral first-person accounts of profound pain and loss are grounded in the belief that is important for contemporary audiences to remember it in a personal, even corporal way. The authority of survivor testimony is decidedly experiential. I was there. I saw, I lost, it happened. The central place of truth-telling in processes of national reconciliation and provisional justice in post-apartheid South Africa, for example, has provided the world with an exemplar of how to collect and narrate survivor testimony. In Canada, this patterning effect is evident in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, where statement gathering rather than interviewing is the order of the day. The insistence on this distinction may reflect the dominance of legal discourse in matters of treaty and Aboriginal rights. To gather statements is to suggest that these stories are unmediated and therefore authentic or objective. 
the TRC is merely collecting the eyewitness accounts that are out there already. Its desire to record tens of thousands of these statements furthers the idea that these testimonies are exhaustive or complete. What more can possibly be said? There is, of course, a political logic in collecting huge numbers of testimonies. Past and present injustice demands recognition. One way of demonstrating the importance of an issue is to reveal its scale and scope. In 2001, Tony Kushner estimated that there were 100,000 Jewish testimonials of the Holocaust collected in written, oral, and video form. The very existence of this vast archive generates a certain moral and political authority that can be claimed by communities, institutions, and individuals. It serves a very tangible purpose in this regard. Still, one wonders who is actually listening to the hundreds of, th of thousands of hours of testimony being recorded. In the case of the Show of Visual History Foundation, we know that remarkably few people have actually listened to any one of those 55,000 interviews. Has anyone here ever listened to one? The collection has therefore served more as a site of memorial than as a site of learning and listening. We know it's there, we can point to its existence, but the potential of these interviews to reveal and to relate remains largely untapped. This point leads me to my main critique of large-scale testimony projects and the collection impulse. In the laudable effort to demonstrate the importance of the history being recounted, these ambitious projects have severely limited the time spent with individual survivors who are asked to communicate the full impact of this violence in less than an hour, in the case of the TRC, or 90 minutes in the case of the Visual History Foundation. In theory, the Shoah Project interviewers were expected to spend 20% of the recorded interview on the pre-war period, 60% on the Holocaust, and up to 20% on the aftermath. In practice, however, far less time was spent on the post-war lives of survivors. Time simply ran out. In the case of the TRC, we learn a great deal about what happened in those schools, and this is tremendously important. But do we hear enough about the long-term impact of the violence as it ripples outward through the lives of individuals, families, and communities? In interviewing so many, do we actually diminish the devastating impact? The shift from testimony to life story is therefore a fundamental one, as the focus becomes the person rather than the event, and the perspective changes from an outward act of witness to an inward reflection on the meanings derived from one's life's journey. The long durée of the life lived with the requisite attention to the before and the after provides a different context in which to explore the meanings of mass violence. It becomes more deeply personal and more explicitly subjective. What is remembered and why is vitally important in oral, oral history. Meaning and memory can be found in the words spoken but also in the form and structure of the oral narratives as well as the voice and the body. What is not said is as important as what is said, and we're very much interested in people's relationship to their own story. There is also a wider collaborative context. The Montreal Life Stories project was built on the framework of shared authority, a phrase coined by Michael Frisch in 1990 to describe the co-creation of the interview. The dialogic nature of the interview, researchers' questions and narrators' responses, produces a unique source. But is authority always shared in the interview? As psychologist Henry Greenspan has pointed out, not every interview is the same, and true partnership must be constantly worked at. A good interview, he writes, is a process in which two people work hard to understand the views and experience of one person, the interviewee. Our project has so far conducted more than 450 multi-session interviews ranging from two to 20 hours, the average being probably about five hours. At the outset, we decided that it was important that everyone involved in the project, faculty, students, community partners, staff, 
tech support, everyone, participate in the interviewing itself. We wanted to feel it in our chests, this shared experience of interviewing. In the process, I have come to realize that there is no perfect location for the interviewer. Team members interviewed parents, grandparents, other members of their own cultural community, members of other cultural communities. We had university people interviewing community people and vice versa. All of these constellations led to, a different, to different kinds of conversations. Not better, not worse, just different. This diversity is one of the core strengths of our project, and we're now over 150 affiliate people all in Montreal. The sharing authority ideal also provide us with a challenge. How to carry forward the notion of shared authority from the interview to subsequent stages of the research process? How do we include a wider circle in the conversation? And in what ways might digital technologies and the arts be employed to bridge divides and be integrated into our research practice. Collaboration need not end when the audio or video recorder is turned off. Collaborative practice, practice encourages, even demands, renewed ethical reflection. It requires a continual monitoring of one's own practice and corresponding adjustment in the light of its effects. As Michael Frisch notes, a commitment to sharing authority is a beginning, not a destination, and the beginning of a necessarily complex, demanding process of social and self-discovery. There are no easy answers or formulas and no simple lessons. Digital media is encouraging us to go beyond collection, to curate spaces of engagement, participation, and collaboration. All of our public interviews are streamed into a searchable database using Stories Matter software. This is a software that we developed in-house. And I can certainly answer questions about uh, the software. Um, the interesting thing about it is it allows us to actually interact with the audio video recording itself. And, and, and the result is very different from, say, transcription. If you transcribe an interview, you're really in the in the words, right? You're very attentive to each word and metaphor and so on. That's really a great process. What this does is you're basically mapping narrative, right? And you start seeing the holes or, or, or where interviewees want to linger forever for an hour, right? And then other places that they sort of skip over. And so for narrative analysis, it opens up all kinds of, of possibilities. Interview materials also incorporate into documentary and animated film, online digital stories, audio tours, art installations, performances of all kinds, radio programming, exhibitions, and of course the classroom. Authority is shared as much as possible through this post-production process. In digital storytelling, for example, instead of extracting those parts of the recorded interviews that might speak to me, we ask interviewees what story they would like to share with the world. They are then asked how we might best tell this story. The resulting three to 20 minute digital story is co-created. You can view many of these digital stories on our website. Clearly then, the Life Stories project has many different kinds of spaces where stories are being told. We are intensely aware of the ethical issues raised when every meeting, workshop, performance, screening, and even email we use Basecamp software, which captures a lot of our, of our ongoing activity. It's part of an ongoing conversation and subject to reflection and publication. In collaboration, self-reflexivity and ethnography become virtually indistinguishable. In partnership, what constitutes a research activity of the project and is therefore subject to university ethics and what does not is also murky. As a result, we are constantly faced with new ethical questions. Practically speaking, what do informed consent, right of withdrawal, and the mitigation of harm mean in these other kinds of spaces beyond the interview? What are ethical obligations to community-based members of the project team? In a project as big and complex as this one, the ethical issues are manifold, posing an extraordinary set of challenges. 
This is an important issue, as the lone interviewer has long dominated the imagination of oral historians, so much so, in fact, that oral history practice has often been equated with the interviewer-interviewee relationship exclusively. Most of the field's training guides and methodological articles assume that the interviewer is also the primary researcher. If authority is shared, it is generally understood within the confines of the interview and its transcription. There has therefore been remarkably little reflection on oral history methodology and ethics and project-based research. I think this is one of the biggest impacts of the digital turn is the shift towards project-based research. Nor have we seriously considered how oral history practice is being transformed by new media and the arts itself. Recent calls, again, to share authority after the interview have complicated matters, opening up new spaces, as I said, of conversation. Increasingly, the recorded interview is but one step in a longer continuum of collaboration. In project-based research, for example, the line between the researcher and the researched is sometimes blurred, and what is on and off the record is somewhat ambiguous. And in university ethics, you know, it's presumed that, that researchers are over here and the researched are over there, and we're going to police these two very distinct groups of people. This changing context demands that we widen our conception of oral history practice and consider the ethical challenges and responsibilities in community university collaboration. The interview is only part of the story. Recognizing the limitations of our original ethics framework, the Projects Ethics and Training Committee organized a workshop on collective storytelling ethics in December 2009. The workshop comprised those team members working in radio production, digital storytelling, participatory media projects, um, um, and several performance-based methodologies, including playback theater, which comes out of, of drama therapy. The transcription of the workshop records a frank and honest discussion of the challenges faced in doing this kind of collaborative cross-disciplinary research. The workshop was meant to initiate a conversation within the project about what informed consent, mitigating harm, and right of withdrawal mean in these other project spaces. Now for the purpose of this talk, I will focus first on radio, and it fit, follows very well with some of the earlier discussions, and then on performance. Oral history and radio have enjoyed a long-standing relationship. Public broadcasters in Great Britain, Canada, and the United States have produced several large-scale oral history projects. The BBC's Millennium Memory Bank comes to mind, as does StoryCorps in the United States. For seven months, the Montreal Life Stories Project sponsored a weekly program on French language community radio where a studio guest was interviewed live for 50 minutes. Thereafter, the project switched its focus to producing in-house radio programming for several radio stations. These short radio documentaries, about 37 thus far, have explored various parts of the Life Stories project. Radio has therefore provided us with the opportunity to, to listen to ourselves as well as to showcase our work to others. One of the challenges that we have faced as a project has been the need to reconcile long-established oral history and radio practices. Radio interviewing is often not often thought of as a research activity. Nor do media interviews typically fall under the rubric of research with human subjects. Were our radio interviews subject to our normal interviewing procedures? Complicating matters further, it was an established radio program with its own identity. Were these even project interviews to begin with? Were we the ones being interviewed? You can appreciate the definitional problems. The answers to these questions would determine if signed consent forms were required. Moreover, how does the right of withdrawal play out when the interview is live and on air? And how might we mitigate the potential harm of a live interview? Participants in the ethics workshop struggled to answer these kinds of questions. It was noted that the initial live interviews had taken place without consent forms being signed. In radio, the act of going to a radio station and sitting in a studio was in itself a form of consent. This makes sense, but was it enough? Workshop participants also grappled with the thorny issue 
of what is research activity and who is a researcher. Most of the radio interviewees were community researchers within our own project, who were also survivors. Do the same ethical obligations apply when co-researchers speak to one another? We discuss the competing practices in oral history research and community radio, agreeing in the end to require written consent henceforth. The group also agreed to go back to former guests to ask them to sign consent forms. Until that happened, the recordings of the live interviews would not be incorporated into our research database or be made otherwise available. The subsequent podcasting of live interviews and radio documentaries was also discussed. Warren Lynn's chair of our ethics committee felt that there was a difference between a live broadcast and interviews archived online. Several others agreed. For Liz Miller, a filmmaker, consent is largely about understanding the breadth of distribution. Our radio interviewees aware that it's not just live, but also available on the internet. Now this distinction matters for refugees in particular, who may have more to fear from a global audience than a local one. This honest conversation ultimately led to a revision of our radio production process to make it more collaborative. Today, the project's radio producers work with interviewees in the co-production of the radio documentaries, much like what we do with digital storytelling. Oral history and theatrical performance enjoy a similarly unique synergy. In fact, there's been a surging interest in performing oral history in recent years. Last year, I co-taught a year-long studio seminar in oral history and performance with a professor from theater. All of our theater and history students participated in interviewing as well as embodying the collected stories in performance. Much of the oral history performance work out there can be grouped under the heading of verbatim theater. Verbatim theater shares the same collaborative impulse as oral history, yet the two fields are rarely in direct conversation. As you might expect, a great deal of emphasis is placed in verbatim theater on the authenticity of the stories being performed and its roots in real life. Not surprisingly, the ethics of transforming people's stories has been explored by a large number of theater scholars and practitioners. And one of the most insightful articles um, that I've encountered on this subject, Julie Salverson relates her experience of watching a student play about Bosnian children and landmines. The production raised important concerns in her mind. And I quote, what disturbed me was a sense that the students were not present in the performance, that they were not seeing themselves in the picture, and consequently that we as audience members were neither asked nor able to implicate ourselves. Audience and actors together were looking out at some exoticized and deliberately tragic other. Salverson went on to comment on the voyeuristic appeal of watching the almost erotic performance of pain. In doing so, she wondered, what was our obligation as witnesses to this story, to this unacknowledged pleasure? Yes, the audience was moved, but by and toward what? How can we ethically tell stories of violence in the context of theatrical performance? And again, the same question I think can be asked in terms of online diffusion. These are fundamental questions for any project that wants to stage stories of loss and survival. To date, the Life Stories project has produced a wide variety of performances ranging from a verbatim theater project with Montreal's Armenian community to the staging of Congo drama. And there's many photos here uh, from the Congo drama. A large scale community theater piece by and for the city's Congolese community. There have also been sound and video installations, interpretive dance, and a full-scale professional theatre play. Each of these projects raises unique questions and challenges. I'd like to briefly introduce you to two of these projects. In Sandeep Bagwadi's gestural theatre, Lamentations, I played it, uh, a video before, before we started, and that was, that was Lamentations. He combines traditional texts with the contemporary fragments from those marked by mass violence. The fragments are gestural. 
a composer of chamber and orchestral music, Bagwadi directed each actor to study the gestural repertoire of a single interviewee, making them their own. And yet, they were told to watch the interviews with the, with the audio turned off. As a result, the gestures could not be understood in relation to the stories being told. The actors thus knew very little about the person whose gestures they were mimicking. The act of suppression of voice, for an oral historian, it's, it's not a good thing, uh, raises questions, of course, but I think productive ones. In reading body language in isolation, do artists end up projecting their own feelings and assumption onto others? Whose story is it? Then again, oral historians regularly suppress the body without a second thought. Are we doing anything differently? And one of the interesting findings they had with this, with this project was that they came to the conclusion that bodies remember. That when people were recalling 1940s Poland, um, their hand gestures changed to what they would have been in that cultural context which I found very, you know, very interesting and exciting. And in the context of our course, when you're forced to actually do improv theater where you're actually having to embody an interviewee, you're listening to that interview in a very different way, right? You have choices to make, like thing, you're, you're, you're tuned to, to accent, for example. You, do, you, do you mimic someone's accent? Is that ethical? Is that, is that silly? Is that, um, or, or, or gestures and so on. By contrast, voices and bodies are put back into conversation in the work of the Living Histories Theatre Ensemble, a playback theatre group embedded in the project. Playback theatre invites audience members to share their stories in a workshop atmosphere. Once told, the actors represent the story back through improvised sounds, movements, and scenes. The original storyteller then gets the opportunity to respond an October 2010 playback session with Holocaust survivors, for example, created a unique way to share stories and encourage intergenerational dialogue combining art and stories. Uh, and I found that the stories that emerged in that space were very, very different from the ones that were emerging in the individual interviews. Other performances have engaged with uh, queer refugees, interviewers themselves, Haitian exiles, and Rwandan genocide survivors. A playback theater session is a highly emotional, personal space. Our ethics workshop discussed the issues of consent, withdrawal, and mitigating harm in that kind of context. And again, there's another line between art and research, which of course is also very, very difficult. Again, you can see the ethical questions that arise when researchers operate at the intersection of art, digital media, and community collaboration. By way of conclusion, the Montreal Life Stories project ends in the coming weeks, as we're entering our final few months, with a month-long series of public activities that we are calling a rencontre, a gathering. Our intention is to occupy a bit of Quebec's public sphere, something that's very important in the context of debates around reasonable accommodation and hysteria around veils and so on. As of this week, 400 Montreal Metro cars are now equipped with Life Story posters. And these are the posters that you've been seeing uh, once in a while. Each one sends interested riders via QR code, something that's used often to sell things to you, uh, to one of nine digital stories developed in collaboration with a survivor of mass violence. The Rencontre program itself consists of a range of public conversations, roundtables, workshops, film screenings, and performances. A theater installation will stand in the atrium of Montreal's Grand Bibliothèque, which is, I think, a very symbolic place in terms of Quebec, for the entire month of March. And we are launching a major new exhibition uh, called New Sums EC at the Centre d'Histoire de Montréal, uh, the city's very innovative museum of memory, which will be there for the next 13 months. So if you come through Montreal between now and next, uh, next May, I very much hope that you attend. One of my personal contributions to uh, the coming month is an audio walk uh, called A Flower in the River, co-created with Phil Lichty, a master's student in computational arts, and Lisa Dejuru, a Rwandan community member in our project, a long-serving member of our coordinating committee, 
and since September, one of my doctoral students, and she is also a, a performer by, by background. Montreal's Rwandan community comes together in April each year to commemorate the hundreds of thousands of Tutsi who were murdered during the 1994 genocide. For several years now, Paj Rwanda, formed by the parents and friends, the victims of the genocide, now living in Montreal, has organized a commemorative walk to the Sailors Memorial Tower on the St. Lawrence River in the Vieux-Port. And this is a memorial tower that, that was uh, built for uh, merchant marine people who died during World War II. Community members are asked once they arrive at the base of the memorial tower to pick some flowers from a commemorative wreath and to toss them into the St. Lawrence River. Rivers have great ritualistic and symbolic importance in Rwandan history and culture, first under the Tutsi monarchy and then during the genocide. In a massive ritual purification of the body politic, Hutu genocidaire threw some of the dead and dying into the rivers and thousands of bodies washed up downstream on the shores of Lake Victoria. Years later and a half a world away, Rwandan Montrealers have transformed a Canadian river and an existing memorial tower into their own site of collective remembrance. And the audio tour follows the route of the commemorative walk. And as you walk, you are accompanied by the voices of six members of the Rwandan community who tell you a bit of their individual story, one after the other. And it crosses the line between Tutsi and Hutu. And I find audio tours um, very powerful because one of my critiques of online memoryscapes is that people are, are constantly moving online, right? They're constantly surfing. And how do you create a space online where you slow things down for people to actually listen? Whereas when you have an in situ um, uh, walk like this, there's a structure, there's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's, a, there's a control over time in a way that is very, very difficult when it's strictly online. So as you see, I, I see the project itself as a curatorial process. Embedded within the curatorial act is the hope of effecting social change to make the world a better place. A pedagogy of witness, Roger Simon writes, is concerned both to establish the factual occurrence of violence and its lived consequences, and to mobilize a productive, affective response the representation of this violence. Thank you. So I'm open to questions. It's been a long day, I realize. Um, well, we find within our project um, a wide, a very you know, cultural differences, for example, right? That many of the uh, Cambodian interviews, for example, are the longest, right? And you have a single session which includes two meals, so it goes on for eight hours, right? Try to, and we have to database that, right? Um, whereas in, in, in the Jewish community, they tend to be far shorter, right? Um, so I think they're, you know, I think you're right in, in the sense of the, um, there are, there are patterns there. Um, normally in a, an interview, um, I think it's important to think that these are, these are not, you know, sometimes we think of testimony, you think, well, the story's there, it's just a matter of just recording it, right? And, and I think what's important is that, um, that interviewees, people have questions about their own experience too. And, and so thinking of the interview as a workspace, right? 
I think is a really important shift. Um, in the context of, of interviewing, often the pattern is that uh, it begins with short answers and it grows longer as, as, uh, as trust is built. Uh, we find, however, with Holocaust survivors that it's flipped. That um, uh, because people have been uh, telling their story in classrooms, for example, for the last 30 years, um, they want to start with their testimony. And so you have a 40-minute you have, you have testimony and then you have a conversation after. And so you have very different dynamics going on um, across the project. And, and again, because the project um, uh, includes many, 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 many community people, um, the dynamics are, are very different. I'm thinking of like we have six team members who interviewed a parent. And so I'm interviewing those interviewers and I'm asking them about what's going on, um, like how it was, right? And, uh, and what we're finding is, is, you know, one of the questions I have is that, you know, did it change anything in your family? Did it open up a, a conversation after the interview, right? And I know for several people in the Cambodian community um, who interviewed their parents, uh, there was huge silence, right? And these are people who are the generation 1.5 or generation 2, uh, second generation. And they've had these burning questions for so long, right? Um, and, uh, and so, yeah, and so you have this, 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 this very, you know, very diverse response. I should say that, that one of our, our, our methodologies I think is very interesting is that um, every interviewer must file a reflection within 24 hours of each interview session. That means we have over a thousand of these reflections, and these are often two or three page reflections where they're reflecting not only on their own practice, you know, what went wrong, what went well, their feelings, but also what they're hearing, right? And so, so again, moving beyond collection, there's, a, there's an amazing learning curve that goes on in each interview space, right? We, we, you know, it's, it's, it's hyper, you're hyper aware as an interviewer, uh, doors are opening and closing, you're knocking on doors saying, can I come into this part of your life? And they're saying, no, 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 but you can come over here, and so on. And so you learn this, but you forget it very quickly, right? And so it's very important that, that, that we document it. Um, another thing I'll say is that we also have monthly debriefing sessions where interviewers come together to reflect on, 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 on their practice, right? And these are really rich conversations within the project. And, and we're really trying to build in reflexivity, right? So we're constantly reflecting on, on what's going on, these logics, right, of what we're hearing, what we're doing, and so on. Um, our approach to interviewing is open-ended. Uh, we have an interview guide, so we have a space that we want to cover, uh, and we have a, a good idea of what we want to cover, but we also say, well, the interviewee has a space they want to cover, right? And it may be like this, or maybe like this, or maybe like this, right? Uh, and the important thing for us is that people have the time to actually explore all those spaces, right? And wouldn't, be a t wouldn't it be a terrible thing if someone has agreed to be interviewed because they have a story to tell, but the researcher has not given them the space, right, to, to go where they feel is important. And in my own experience, I find that often their spaces are actually more important than your own because your own space is defined on what you think is you already, what you already know, right? Interview guides are based on what you already know, not what you're going to be learning. Um, and so I'm not sure if I'm answering, I'm sort of doing a hodgepodge, but I... I, I I, I think this, this diversity is what I want to really emphasize, that, that it's, it's the subjectivity uh, of these interviews that are, that, that are their power. Um, oral historians in the 50s or in the 60s and 70s were trying to get um, uh, respect in the academy, and they went about trying to get respect in the academy by emphasizing, uh, by building social scientific scaffolding around their process. And so words like sampling, representativity, were very regularly used by oral historians to sort of say, we can trust these sources, right? These are objective sources, right? We can trust it. And Alessandro Pertelli, who's a, an amazing Italian folklorist who really defined the field of oral history, he sort of said, well, no, these are not objective sources. These are subjective sources. These are, this is not the truth. These are their truths. This is the world as people see it. And that has value and that is important. And so there we shift to like narration um, and, and putting memory front and center. 
Um, and so really, when we deal with oral history, we're not, it's not the old sort of historical way where you suppress the present to study the past as if we aren't part of the present. It's really about the relationship between past and present that's very central to the whole process, right? Um, and, uh, and that's certainly how we're approaching, uh, approaching our work. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we've been working with them. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, 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 and yeah. So when you're interviewing survivors, I mean, there's a whole issue about re-traumatizing. Yeah. So I'm assuming, I mean, you started in, in response to Alan's question, to talk a little bit about training people in the yeah. community and so on. Yeah. Yeah. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that last time. Mm. I'd love to, yeah. Um, well, first of all, I, I don't use survivors too often because we really believe that people need to define themselves. Uh, and, and some people define themselves as survivors, others are refugees, others are immigrants, others are displaced. And so our, 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 our title is, you know, like, uh, Life Stories of Montrealers Displaced by Large-Scale Violence, because we wanted to keep it open-ended and let people define themselves as much as possible. Um, well, what we developed, we spent the first year developing our method methodology, right, and really thinking through um, all kinds of ethical issues in terms of the interview space itself. Uh, we developed, uh, we had to sort of think through the process and then, and then make our decisions on each step of that process and then develop um, guidelines and then workshop modules. And so we have a core uh, nine-hour course that is compulsory uh, within the project. Um, and, and one of the issues that, on, on that issue you're talking about is um, the issue of mitigation of harm. Okay, you know, and we, one question we always ask ourselves is why why? Why are we asking these questions? You know, is it the right thing to do? You know, we're asking people to go into very hard places. Um, and then if, you know, and if we agree that it's important, uh, and this is what Joy Parr, I think uh, Jane was talking about a bit um, before, earlier on today. Um, but if we decide to go there, I think what I like about life stories too is that it doesn't, it's not just about the violence, right? It's, it's that larger, it's that joy and sorrow that, that, that's sort of mixed together. Um, like one of the issues is do you go in with a medicalized approach, right? Where, where we, know, we know about trauma, we know about the symptoms of trauma, we know uh, things like emotion, uh, silence, repetition, you know, there's a whole list of them. Um, and we, we're faced with the issue of, okay, well, it, do we want to go into an interview with a medicalized approach where every silence, every emotion becomes a symptom of trauma. And if we do that, do we end up actually dehumanizing people? And then who are, and then are we capable of, of being some sort of, you know, are, we're not, we're not professional, we have some psychologists and cultural psychiatrists and so on in the project, but most of us don't have medical training. And so we had, a, we had a, a long process where we worked with medical professionals and so on, and in the end we went with a non-medicalized approach of universal referral where people are, are empowered to help themselves, right? And it comes back to the question earlier on today about paternalism and so on. Um, that said, our methodology of having multiple sessions is a built-in safeguard, right? That we don't just go in and leave and say bye and never to see people again. Uh, that there's a longer continuum, right? And I know with the eugenics archive, um, we've had really great conversations with them, and their 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 manual is actually based on our manual um, that we have. Um, but there's other issues like uh, what happens when people name names. Um, you know, so and so killed my family. Can, can I have yeah. Hmm. Yeah, yeah. And so how do you handle the archiving of that and the availability of that? Yeah, I was just about to answer that. And, and, 
Um, uh, well, again, like, like, if people have the courage to name names. If that's what they want to do. You know, do we airbrush that out or not, right? And if we let it stand, do we become liable of, you know, if, if it crosses issues of slander and so on? And we had, a, again, a debate about that. And our, and our policy is that it stands, but if it gets published online, if it, if it moves to publication, then it gets edited, right? But the interview itself stands. Now, we're doing databases, right? Uh, but those databases are of the, of the actual interview, so names and all. Uh, but those databases will not be online open access. They'll be online behind a password protected barrier where you can visit and you sign a, a form, right, of access and so on. So it's like virtually visiting the archive. Um, but, uh, you know, is that, does that protect the interviewee? Does that protect the project? Uh, I don't know, right? Uh, there's never been a case in Canada um, in terms of, of oral history uh, and these kinds of issues. Um, there's a recent one in the United States uh, dealing with the Irish Republican Army where um, uh, a court challenge in, 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 in Ireland uh, wanted to access confidential interviews, right? And so our practice for anonymous interviews is that those interviews are transcribed. The transcription goes back to the interviewee because it's not just the name that outs people, it's actually the stories. And people can then cross off whatever they want and then that, that transcription is updated and then it's public and then we destroy the, the original recording because otherwise uh, a subpoena might come around um, and, what do you, and, and it, it might not be my decision, right? It might be Concordia, which is like any institution quite spineless, right? <laughs> um, um, another issue is that, is that our interviews are not, our, our consent forms are not copyright. You'll, not, you'll never see copyright in any consent form that I'm ever involved in. These are right of use agreements, right? Uh, these are their stories. What we're asking for is the right to reproduce and use these stories. And in order to do that for informed consent, you have to really be very explicit, of course, in terms of the various ways it might be used. And so we have layers of consent that, that's very, you know, I think very important. Uh, but again, to me, that's empowering interviewees uh, in, 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 in real ways. And, and believe me, if we're doing this audio tour right now, there's a lot of empowerment there. Like, 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 like there's, you know, we're, there's a lot of negotiation that has to happen, but that's, that's great. For me, it's, it's not overly complicated. Like I, I, it's a collaborative project, right? It's a shared conversation. We've all, you know, it seems trite, but it, 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 you know, at its best, it's very transformative at a personal level. And so, you know, what I wanted to communicate is that what I'm saying here is, is I don't own what I'm saying here, right? That, 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 that what I'm saying here is a product of, of seven years of, uh, you know, people working hard together, right, on all kinds of tough issues. Um, and so this is my way of bringing them in and to maybe decenter me a bit, right, uh, to, sh to see them. But also I, I think it just shows, you know, um, it, to me it communicates um, the richness of the possibilities after the interview, right, that, that, that traditional scholarship uh, which is very solitary, I and mean, I, I, I love scholarship. I'm, you know, I love I love archives, right? I'm not bashing archives, um, like textual archives, um, but as opposed to digital collections. And, uh, uh, but I, I, um, uh, I I'm really interested in how these stories can become a catalyst, right, 
for you know not only reflection but also political action, and 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 too often we we try to you know say well there's advocacy there's uh, there's, there's there's arts over here and there's this over here and I find in our project we all inhabit the same space you know and 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 I you know like artists who are doing their work and they're interpreting these stories and they're in these and they're and they're generating these stories their process is often not as different from my own as you'd expect, right? Um, and so wadding the circle makes you much more, I think, modest because you realize that you're just a small part of that conversation. Um, um, and so the curation word, I, I have mixed feelings about curation, it's over, overused, but um, the idea is that it's, you know, it, you know, we're creating this space together, right? It's not one person. And the example I'd use in terms of base camp is, um, uh, you know, how you incorporate digital technologies, it's not so much a question to me of yes or no, it's, it's the how and to what end. And um, when we incorporate Basecamp, which again captures so much um, and so little, uh, uh, you know, we could have organized it where, where each working group had their own spaces and then uh, the coordinating committee would be able to see everything. So it could have been like a very pyramid model of, of surveillance, right? Um, but what we wanted was we wanted to um, have a project-wide horizon, right? And one of the challenges in large projects is hierarchies, and it's also uh, projects that become a bunch of small projects that are all doing parallel play. And so trying to create mechanisms where people are in dialogue and in, and in shared reflection, um, you know, digital technology to me is a huge, you know, a huge, huge asset, right? And as certainly, you know, um, um, you know, I couldn't imagine a, a project like ours 10 years ago, to be honest. Um, you know, what's possible now is, is, and what's possible 10 years from now will be, will be different again, and that's what's so exciting. Um, the talk about sort of the unlimited archives of the internet and so on, it gets, it almost gets to be like the mathematical sublime, right? It's almost like these, it's almost like the show of Visual History Foundation saying those 55,000 interviews you know, it leaves me a bit cold a little bit, right? Um, um, it's what you do with this access, what you do with these connections and so on. To me, that's, that's so important. And, and how you connect that digital, uh, you, know, the, 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 you know, the online realm and, and the physical spaces, right? So multi-platforms and so on. That's where I get really excited, right? Is in, the, is in those exchanges. Yeah. Well, it, it, again, the community members are often doing the performances, right? And so it's not it's not a, a consumer <laughs> thing. But I'll I'll give, I'll give you I'll give you a great example. Um, uh, it comes from the Rwandan community, which is one of the working groups I work most closely with. And and um, again, every April they have this commemorative activity. And two years ago they had a day of reflection, right? So you can imagine a room with about 150 people, right? Um, you know, 85, 90 percent Rwandan. You know, uh, families, multi generation, and so on. And they were in this room for eight hours, right? And they divided the day into three parts. And so at the beginning of each part, they had a digital story. So we watched a 20 minute uh, segment where they basically wove together different individual stories on a theme. So we'd watch that. There'd be a panel of, of elders, right? People who were interviewed who would reflect on what they saw and then their own story. And there was a QA session where they, where they debated some issues that were very um, contested, right? Things like the role of the Catholic Church in the genocide where there's not consensus, right? So it was, it was actually quite you know, heated but positive. But what I wanted to tell you about it was at the end of each of these three parts is that everyone in the room had a pile of these um, memory cards, like the old card catalog. I don't, I'm, I'm dating myself, right? But you know, the old card catalog things, right? They're that big. And so you had a date and then you had space to write in a memory. And so people would write memories, and what they had was a timeline. It was called a ligne de temps. And so you had you know, 1959 to 2010. And throughout the day, people would go up and pin their, their memory card in. And by the end of the day, you had a wall of memory, right? 
And that wasn't an idea that some academics sort of said, here's, you know, here's, here's a good exercise for you. This came up from them, right? And, uh, and again, I, I found it just, again, fascinating because, you know, in, certainly in oral history, the challenge is how do you go from the individual to the collective? And here they were composing a collective narrative, right, to encompass exiles, people who, who, were, who, who, who left before 94, people who were in Rwanda in 94, people who were born after 94. Uh, and of course, it's very political, too, in terms of, um, 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 you know, what's happening in Rwanda today. Um, and it was, a, it was a beautiful process, and to me as an example of oral history being a catalyst, you know, creating a space, a physical space, where the community is doing, I think, really important memory work. Um, and then the, it's also going into places like, um, like one of our, our co-researchers, uh, Emmanuel Habimana, he's, he's Hutu, and he's a psychologist, and he talks about the meaning of 1994 for him, you know, like before 94, his ethnicity was not central to his identity, right? He was, if anything, a Pan-Africanist, right? Uh, 94 happens, and suddenly he could no longer deny his Hutu background, because to do that would be to deny the, the genocide. And he talked about, and he talks about his own child, right? You know, the legacy, the inheritance of that, right? And so that's going on in this room, too. And, and so I think, you know, it's all a beginning, um, but there's a process there that I find, I find fascinating. Uh, the Cambodian group organized an international conference last May where they mobilized academic knowledge, essentially, like global people, right, from all over, Alex Hinton from you know, New Jersey and people from all around the world. And it was really about educate, about using that to actually open up a, a space to break silence within the community, essentially, where there's been this huge silence, right, uh, about uh, the Khmer Rouge and, and, and the complexities of that, right, because the community is very politically divided. Um, and also that, that, those generational issues, which I'm talking about, which I talked about earlier. Um, and generations have become very central to our whole project because we have so many young people involved in the project. We have dozens and dozens and dozens of, of young people who, um, who come with questions, and that has shaped our research profoundly, right? Um, and, so, and so it's a living, you know, I, I guess Tri-Council would call it emergent research, right? Um, but it's, evol it's evolving and, and I find it's living and I find that really, really exciting and enriching and I'm no longer the historian I was, you know, seven years ago. Yeah, yeah, in and England. With, yeah, yeah. with its collaboration mm. of journalists, artists, poets, yeah. dramatists, sociologists, anthropologists, yeah. producing what we call that anthropology of ourselves. Yeah. Um, and one of the reasons why the memory triggered is uh, one of the ways in which that movement is often described is um, in terms of uh, Clifford's notion of that the graphic surrealism, mm -hmm. where you have this incredible mm -hmm. confluence mm -hmm. of juxtaposition and mm -hmm. creativity. Mm -hmm. Mm. I was just wondering to what degree, if any degree, um, the mass observation project had been something of a precedent that you had. Mm. Um, I don't think the mass observation um, precedent is well known within oral, oral history circles, to be honest. Like, I, I, I know it, right? And, and, and it's not because of reading an oral history, it's about reading more, more widely. Um, um, you know, every, every subdiscipline has its own origin story, right? And ours is, is Columbia and Berkeley, I guess, right? Uh, and they would destroy their tapes and then just transcribe, right? And they actually interviewed elites, <laughs> so it's very top-down top -down history. Um, but again, my, I, I, I don't want to be too hard on the TRC because it's, it's all, it's all well-intentioned, right? Um, and, and, it's, and it's important. Um, but my critique is that at the end of the day, what they're not interested in, in the survivors themselves, they're interested in what the survivors can tell us about that, which is the big H history, right? And, and, um, um, 
and you know, the fact that the TRC is itself a product of years and years of resistance by Aboriginal people and demands for, for um, um, justice, right, and perhaps reconciliation, um, that story too gets lost, right? And so what you get is a very narrow uh, uh, story, right? Uh, it's the same with Holocaust survivors. We, you know, I've been doing a lot of interviews with Holocaust survivors who've been interviewed two or three times. And what I'm asking them is not so much what happened then. What I'm asking is, okay, you've been going into those classrooms for the last 30 years, right? Telling your story, you know, week after week after week after week after week after week after week. Why? What have you learned? When people raise their hands, what questions are you getting? How's that changed, right? The changing demographics of, of Montreal classrooms. When someone goes Darfur, Darfur, does a Holocaust survivor say, yeah, 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 just like uh, there's a connection there. Or they say, no, no, you know, it's different. Um, and so we have, this, we have this conversation with them as educators, as activists, that they've never had before. And they're so happy and relieved in a way because it, it you know, that's part of, you know, their life as survivors began once the violence ended, right? Yet all of the testimony projects aren't interested in that, right? And to me, that, that, that's really, you know, really unfortunate. And so by, by making it centered on the people, right, and using that as the frame, I think it opens up, um, you know, uh, a lot of connections. And again, I, I'm thinking of the, the community partners, how they're insistent on not just focusing on the horrors, but also the joys and the pride in the community. And so having, you know, that mix, right? Uh, there's a great um, Rwandan, uh, young Rwandan graphic novelist in Montreal called Rupert Bazambanza, and he has a graphic novel called uh, Smile Through the Tears, right? And it's a, it's a beautiful book because, well, a, I, I can critique it too, but, but, but it's a beautiful book because it's, the idea is that forever after, when you remember your family that, that was lost in 94, there's joy because there's, those, are, those are warm memories. But they're also sad memories because you can't help but remember what happened next, right? And, and that, it's, that, it's that, that tension, right, that you see within the communities and within the project, right, um, that I think is, is so, so important. Um, and I certainly, as an academic, you know, you feel this weight of responsibility that I remember our first, our opening, um, when, we, when we launched the project in 2006, we had a, uh, the Cambodian community organize a festival essentially, right? It was like dance and, and um, food, and you had tables set up with like textile, but also tables set up with like uh, books on the, on the genocide from their own basements, right? These are not academics. Um, and, and I remember going, and they had, you know, the stage, they, they, they'd woven, it was fall time, they'd woven uh, uh, maple leaf, uh, like actual leaves into the fabric, right? Like just a, a labor of love, right? And I know every academic in the room had thought, wow, what have we gotten ourselves into? Because we have to deliver. It can't just be the typical project, right? And that is a good feeling to have, right? And I think it's rare in the academy, right? And I think it, it, it pushes you in a way um, and, and be accountable in a way that I think is really, really important. Yeah. Okay, well thanks. Yeah. <laughs>